it then other things emerge, other considerations and other other discussions are had, and, and it, it, it would become an, it, more of a, a topic. But right now, it's just existing in that zone, which is kind of interesting. Also, uh, let's say in 2010, um, I was on the Alex Jones show in, uh, in, in America. Don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a pretty popular um, radio program that goes out to uh, millions of people around the world. And uh, I introduced this concept of uh, crash J.P. Morgan by silver. And the price of silver was about $26 an ounce at that time. And um, this generated a very big response. Hundreds of videos and support was made. And uh, some guy in Canada came out with a silver coin that he ended up uh, selling 50,000 or 100,000 ounces of these coins. Wherever I go, now people come up to me with these. And uh, so I know that they've been distributed out there. And um, so since that time, we've got a new one. So this is a group now in the UK, which is the Birmingham Mint. And this is the new Silver Kaiser. And um, this particular model, which is now just available, will be in the next week or so, is made from recycled silver. So this is all going to be silver that's being recycled or sourced from ESG sourced silver. These are mines that have uh, the ESG uh, designated uh, compatibility with those goals as stated by the UN under social responsibility. And so this dovetails back into the currency wars theme because as the uh, currency wars heat up and as central banks continue to debase their currencies by issuing more fiat money, more paper money, corporations are going to be faced with a decision about what to do with their cash hoards. You know, the economy is in shambles, but corporations are sitting on record amounts of cash, which is one of the reasons why the economy is in shambles. But um, nevertheless, they have huge amounts of cash on their balance sheet. Um, just to pick one company as an example, you've got Apple Computer with something like $120 billion in cash. So as the currency war heats up and they become more concerned about that cash value, they're going to start looking at things like precious metals to protect themselves against the uh, ravages of currency debasement. And when you look at precious metals, they have a mandate under the UN corporate resolution, et cetera, that they have to look at ESG type products. So this would be the only ESG silver bullion, gold bullion product in the market. So they would have to look at this, which means that if the corporations begin to dedicate their cash balances to precious metals, they're going to take an already extremely tight market, gold and silver, and you're bringing in an enormous uh, buyer at that point. And the prices are going to start to reflect, A, the paper money tsunami that's collapsing the economy, and B, overwhelming huge new demand from players that have not been in the market at all. Less than 2% of global investable funds are in precious metals around the world. On corporate cash balance sheets, that's probably less than 2%. So now you've got um, a market which is the total investable global asset investable fund market of approximately, um, I think it's $17 trillion, um, less than 2% is in gold and silver. You, you, you start to shift even 2 or 3% of that money into gold, which is only the entire above ground stock of 150, 60, 160,000 tons of gold, is the, all the gold that's ever been mined in the past 5,000 years. If you start to, uh, it's worth about nine trillion. So here you have 15 trillion looking for a new home. Uh, there's nine trillion in gold, and a lot of that's already in the hands of uh, sovereign states. It's off the market. I think a third is off the market. Silver is extremely tight. There's only a billion ounces of silver above ground available. There's only about 800 million ounces produced per year that comes out of the ground, and there's then that's shrinking. So potentially, like Mark Zuckerberg, could actually own every single available silver ounce in the world today with, the, well, maybe not so much anymore, but a few weeks ago, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, back in the, uh, well, a few of those guys. Let's, so it would only take, uh, it's only 33, 30, 35 billion dollars gets, gets you every single ounce of silver available in the world today. So it doesn't, this is part of the campaign for the crash JP Morgan buy silver was, Again, 
under the currency wars, under the banking fraud, under the wealth confiscation, under the hope to empower people with things like Bitcoin, is to put another tool in their hands, which is that if you take physical silver off the market, you're, it's a direct attack on these banks' balance sheet, in particular J.P. Morgan, when they took over Bear Stearns, they inherited a three billion ounce position of naked silver shorts. Which means that they've got three billion ounces of silver that they've sold short, uh, which is, uh, but naked sold short, which refers to a practice of selling contracts that don't even exist. And um, this used to be a controversy um, a while ago in terms of does short selling, naked short selling exist? And then here's, a, here's something from The Economist magazine from this past year. A rare slip-up by lawyers has helped to shed some light on a high-profile legal battle. In a normal short sale, shares are borrowed, or at least located, before being sold. In a naked short sale, there is no attempt to pre-borrow the stock, or even check that it exists. Creating fails to deliver. This messes with the laws of supply and demand. Duh. <laughs> allowing shorting of, uh, to exist beyond the actual limits of the number of shares outstanding. Um, this comes from unredacted documents from Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch who were committing these fraudulent acts. So this was in the financial, this was in The Economist in May of the 2012 edition. This is this has now come out in the public domain, the existence of these firms engaged in naked short selling. They're, they're selling stock or futures contracts that don't exist. Another word for that is counterfeit. And that's exactly what, what they're engaged in. We saw that famously during the 2008 market crash with Lehman Brothers, when more stock was sold short than existed in the entire flotation of the company. As Wall Street ganged up, and put that company out of business to make a quick buck because those short sales paid off. You're buying your naked shorts back at that zero price. You're closing out the trade. You, that's how you make that profit because you're making the difference between what you originally sold at and then what you're buying to cover the way the short sale works. So this, this, again, the massive fraud. So you, see, you start to see how fraudulent the system is. The martingale betting strategy, naked short selling, um, You've got, um, here's an interesting statistic. Bankers in the UK cost everyone in the UK eight pounds 40 for every one pound they produce. So that includes the bailouts, the public debt, the unemployment. So for, for every, so, so that's a very broad number obviously. Um, and, and you would immediately get some, you know, some, some blowback from that industry who would, who would start to say, well, those bailouts are not expensive, et cetera. But you, when you start to see the pattern of fraud here, when you start to see um, everything that's, that, 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 that's involved, here, here's another interesting, um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. I'll just give you some other banking frauds that have been in the news lately. Uh, Barclays is sorry for the LIBOR rigging as profits beat estimates. We are sorry for what happened. <laughs> However, our leadership continues to focus on the delivery of our financial performance targets. They committed massive fraud. They, they, they're, they're sorry. <laughs> the profits aren't interrupted. The money, the fine that they'll pay will be paid for from committing more fraud. And the key word is the, but. What? The key word is but. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 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 creating this cycle of fraud. You're not penalizing them in any meaningful way. You are giving them an incentive to do more fraud, to pay the minimal fine that you impose for committing the last round of fraud. And by the way, the frauds get bigger and more frequent. And to bail it out, the central banks have to keep interest rates closer to zero. And they have to keep printing money with more quantitative easing. So this, 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 well, this cycle is turning harshly negative. <coughs> you know, Bitcoin is, uh, finally, when I fun, wrap this up, I'll you know, do, compare Bitcoin to gold and silver and see where I'm getting at. Um, it's not all bad news, though. Here uh, is a story from China. 
Abu Yang, once one of the richest women in China, was sentenced to death for swindling 57 million from investors. That's a deterrent, ladies and gentlemen. This is a deterrent. Um, her crimes, uh, even in, so yeah, I mean, this is uh, a thing. <laughs> That line usually gets a big round of applause, to tell you the truth, but uh, I mean, usually I'm, I'm uh, in Ireland or, or Athens. <laughs> so in Ireland or Athens, people are like, kill the fuckers. <laughs> Sean Fitzpatrick in Anglo-Irish, let's fucking kill them. Yeah. Yeah. Here in the UK, which is the center of global banking fraud, <laughs> You know, you're like, wait a minute, that might cut into my martini right there. <laughs> I said, oh, this is lovely. AIG, London. Murray, Bernie Madoff, London. MF Global, London. The London Whale, London. Uh, you know, it's all online because it's rehypothecations allowed in London. London is a global banking fraud. There's no regulation at all in London. So I can understand why there might be none. It's titters and what? Uh, more, 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 oh yeah, of course I like to also to collect uh, what, what the, uh, the, the powerful, the, the establishment likes to, uh, oh here's an interesting, this is a, uh, a 100 trillion dollar Zimbabwe note. This is uh, kind of a ghost of Christmas future. It's a Barack Obama dollar. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's, some, uh, here's some quotes from, from the people who are a part of the establishment who run, who run uh, the run things. Here, here's one from Larry Summers. Larry Summers, you know, uh, is constantly being on the presidential authority, you know, advisory boards, runs Harvard every now and then. He says, the central irony of the financial crisis is that while it, caused, it was caused by too much confidence, too much borrowing and lending and too much spending, it can only be resolved with more confidence, more borrowing and lending, and more spending. <laughs> Here's uh, Paul Krugman. <coughs> Alan Greenspan needs to create a housing bubble to replace the NASDAQ bubble. Here's Tony Blair. I could cash in a lot more than I do, you know. Here's another Paul Krugman. My proposal is that we have to get a bunch of scientists to tell us we're facing an alien invasion. And in order to be prepared for that invasion, we have to do things like build high-speed rail. And once we've recovered, we can say, look, there were no aliens. <laughs> this, this, is a, this, is, this is a seminal moment, actually, uh, for the, uh, any, any fans of Ayn Rand in the audience? <laughs> okay, so. Of course, Ayn Rand, the, the biggest proponent of Ayn Rand is Alan Greenspan. And he said, talking not directly about Ayn Rand, but indirectly, quote, I guess I should warn you, if I turn out to be, no, that's not actually the quote, sorry. Um, right, he said, um, quote, I have found a flaw. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in the firms. Those of us who have looked to self-interest are in a state of shock. I see. So the entire theory was a load of cod wallop. Okay. Uh, he went on to say, uh, he went on to say, of course, or he said previously to this, I guess I should warn you, if I turn out to be particularly clear, you've probably misunderstood what I've said. <laughs> so these, I like to go back to uh, a couple from the previous centuries. Here's one from Frederick Bastiat, 1850. When plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it, and a moral code that glorifies it. That, that's the time that we're living in now. The, the, the current legal system and the banking system glorifies and promotes plunder. Uh, and then, of course, the one from John Locke. When the social contract is broken, the people must revolt. Sounds like good advice there. 
Uh, so I've got about uh, two hours left on this uh, presentation. Uh, okay, so I want to wrap it up with, uh, I want to talk about uh, gold and uh, silver versus uh, Bitcoin. And um, so, if you, because I think that you can make the case that they're, they're comparable in many ways. And um, so if you go back to, let's say, 2,300 years ago, Aristotle's qualities of good money. You know, Aristotle was the first to talk about gold as, as, a, as good money. So these, these are the things that he talks about must be, must be in place. Uh, it must be durable, so it must withstand the elements. It must be portable. It must be divisible and consistent or fungible. And it must have intrinsic value. So by, by using those standards, you know, I think you can certainly slot Bitcoin into that. I mean, it's definitely portable. Um, the divisible and consistency aspect or the divisibility of it is far better than gold. Uh, you know, 0.000001 was a bid on the recent auction. Um, the intrinsic value argument is certainly built into, into Bitcoin uh, with the, um, the, the limited supply issues. Um, so it kind of, it, it fits into there, um, and, um, the, um, I think going forward you're going to see a lot more competition actually from gold and silver, a lot more compatibility, um, with, with the two. I, I was looking at gold itself, which is kind of interesting, it's the, the atomic number of 79 for gold. It makes it one of the higher atomic number elements which occur naturally. Like all elements with atomic numbers larger than iron, gold is thought to have been formed from a supernova, a nucleosynthesis process. There are explosions scattered metal containing dust, including gold, into the region of space in which they later condensed into our solar system and Earth. That's Bitcoin here. Now, this is the scattering of the ideas that are condensing into this thing called Bitcoin. This is the, 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 the currency going forward. I, I said that especially for Amir, because he's, he's somewhere, he's, 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 he's enjoying that, that statement, I'm sure. Thank you very much. All right, well, that's it for this portion of the program. Uh, if you want to do any Q&A or anything, happy to do so. Thanks. I'm curious whether you think the Eurozone will break up, and also whether you think that matters. On, on the Eurozone, we, we talk a lot about it on the news. My earliest thoughts about it were that you have one big player, Germany, which is playing this crisis very well, I think. Because to the extent that the peripheral countries are in collapse, whether it's Greece, Ireland, uh, others, it keeps the euro cheap, um, which is a big boom for Germany. Um, as you approach a crisis, and they talk about federalization of the eurozone, and they're going to bring out federalized, you know, more of a central bank type system and more of a federalization of the entire eurozone, that'll be run out of Germany. You know, Frankfurt, Berlin. So they are emerging as big players. I think that there's there's no evidence to, directly to prove this, but it seems remarkable that it seemed that the system is being strangled to the point that on the credit side, to, to, to a day when countries like Greece has given up its sovereignty already. Greece is no longer a sovereign country. Ireland is in what they, they've lost their economic sovereignty, as they call it. Spain is in bad shape. Portugal, basket case. At some, at some point, when they decide to turn that credit spigot on once again, let's say they do something like a quantitative easing we just saw in the States as part of the currency war, um, and credit begins to flow, uh, these countries will have lost their sovereignty effectively, but it'll the situation will be run through Germany. So Germany, you know, they're not, they're, Germany benefits from this, as I see it. You know, they, the whole euro was created at the same time of reunification. The idea of reunification was that, well, we don't want these two countries re coming together again. 
because of what happened, you know, at the end of World War II. But uh, if they are, if they are reunified under the rubric of the euro, you know, they'll, any potential risk of reunification would be mitigated within the context of this huge economic block. But now that block is being run out of Berlin. So, uh, you know, that's been my, my thought during this whole crisis. And um, I think ultimately the, the dollar, the U.S. dollar, is probably a lot weaker and closer to disintegration than the, the euro. Uh, if you wanted to close down Bitcoin, go take more attention, how would you go about it? <laughs> Uh, that that's an interesting you know so 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 you know I, I like the idea of hacking into economies and hacking exchanges and hacking prices and hacking the silver market and hacking JP Morgan and if you're gonna if you're gonna go up against Bitcoin and try to hack Bitcoin you're, you're going against the best hackers in the world so I would not be that guy <laughs> you know I'm not that I'm not that kind of hacker guy there if it were uh, the exchange Immediately, as I saw that, I could think of immediately of five or six ways to game that exchange. You know, but that's a that's a subset of Bitcoin. Uh, uh, you know, the, the the kernel of it. So I'm I'm going to pass. I'm, I'm not going to try even to uh, outline. Uh, you know, maybe in a day or two I could have more. Uh, yeah, I'm not going. Is regulation all this the same? Gave me the market. Regulation all gave me the market. Well, I mean, if you're saying how, what, what are the risks that it will, what, what will kill it? I guess is another question, but not, not how I would hack it, but what, what would, what would kill it? And that would clearly be, as a previous speaker has mentioned, it's going up against this, you know, the, the state, and the state has incredible powers of, of to, to, to get in the way. So that's why I was very intrigued with this idea of the over-the-counter market, where you're creating this. This uh, global grassroots, and we've seen this, you know, throughout the, the. Remember things? What was that the campaign where people would leave the location of a book, and then you could follow the book, and then online that had the book track. Book book crossing. Geocaching. I think it was book crossing. So the, the, these things are germane to the. Community to some degree, people understand that there's the you put the UBS in a brick and you can download stuff on the brick. You know, so this the physical space is it's already been hacked to accommodate this space. So this OTC market, the way it was described, seems like okay, yeah, this is how we're going to create this proliferation. Because it's got to be, it's got to come out in a way that achieves a critical mass. Um, it can't be in incremental. So I don't think it's going to be, I mean, I, I like to think, you know, it can't be, well, we've achieved X number of users, and we're, the goal is to increase the number of users to this point next year. It's got to be more surreptitious than that. It's got to be, we, we need to usurp 51% of the global economy at one time. It's got to be a, a leap somehow. So that's got to be communicated in a way where it, uh, below the radar, you've got people using Bitcoin in a, in a way that when it does finally get on this evening news, it's too late. So that's hard because, okay, we do the show, we promote it on my show, on, you know, on Russia Today, it goes out to 450 million people. So we, we, it's a, it's a trade-off, isn't it? Because if, we, if we, we bring a lot of attention too soon, et cetera. But then again, you need, it, you need, you need the users to, to, expand, to expand the base, right? So I think that the answer, as I, if I, as I see it from this conference, again, are these, that physical space, that OTC space, where you, there's a tremendous amount that can go on completely under, under uh, out of the digital space to, to, to build up the, the, critical, the critical mass. That's okay. I'm writing an article for a Polish newspaper about the perfect country. So uh, what, what is your opinion? What do you think is the perfect country and uh, in, in any way? But what is your opinion? Which, which countries are the best, in your opinion? The perfect country is called Maxistan. <laughs> There's only two people that live in this country, Max and Stacy. <laughs> 
and there's uh, abundant food, and we're naked all day. <laughs> In the South Pacific somewhere. <laughs> if we can have one more question from this guy, and then um, we've got four minutes to clear out this room. Okay. <laughs> I understand from uh, what you said earlier that uh, it seems that the Bank of England has, uh, uh, it's not in their interest to raise their interest rate because they are, uh, by not raising it, they are actually supporting police fraud. And so, uh, what, what do you think are the chances that? them raising their uh, interest rate in the near future? Low, very low. Very, very low. It's not, not going to happen because of this ongoing currency war. So the, um, the, 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 the rates should be increased. That is actually a way out of the current global crisis because you would, banks would then be making money in a legitimate way again, which is to lend money to businesses for a return instead of lending it back to the central bank for um, a subsidy. They're all being subsidized. So that would be a way out of the crisis, but it would also trigger a, a catastrophe in the housing market again, and because everything is completely over leveraged. So politically, it's an unpalatable solution. So instead, they're going down the easy road of quantitative easing and money printing, but the end will be the same. Instead of having a deflationary depression, we're going to have an inflationary depression. But it, the, the depression is, is, is unavoidable. But again, here in this country, in the UK, it, it's really ground zero for global banking fraud. So there's a huge amount of trickle down here, actually, that people are, you know, there's a lot of money that flows through here. Amir had to go uh, back to the hotel because he was really tired and he said to say thank you to, for all of you for attending the conference. And um, a thank you to Max and the congratulations on your engagement recently. Right, we're engaged, Stacey and I are engaged now. Thank you, Max. Thanks, man. Thanks. Come to the party tonight in um, York Street by King's Cross Station, York Road.